Hey, it's Kyle here, and welcome back to another Korea Strategy video. And we're starting in the admin building today, because we reached an important milestone last time, getting our Kerbals into orbit and returning them to the planet safely. Sort of. Anyway, this screen will look a little bit different due to the strategy and mod we've got installed, which completely revamps career mode and the admin building as well. Now that we've achieved orbit, we can choose our first exploration target, which is of course the MUN. And we have a choice to either probe the MUN or send a crewed mission. However, if we send a crew, it does block off the unmanned missions. And this is career mode. Money and science are our goal. So we're going to get two bites of the cherry here. We'll be sending the bots first, collecting a whole load of cash money, science and fame as we go. And then we'll send the Kerbals after, which of course means more profit. <gasps> In between this video and our last career outing, I did a few cash grab launches to get our thumbs up. Grabbing several parts testing missions and making a bunch of ugly looking crafts that I dubbed the Pinocchio series. Over the course of four flights, we completed 12 contracts, including a orbital satellite deployment, which we promptly deorbited. The fourth launch brought us back a wealth of science data to help us bootstrap our way to the MUN on our wonderful temporary rocket named Spud. And before you ask, it was indeed inspired by the first human-made object to achieve orbit, a corned beef sandwich. Obviously, not being serious here, but if you would like a fun bit of spaceflight trivia, Gemini 3 astronaut John Young snuck a corned beef sandwich into the capsule for their mission and proceeded to munch on it in orbit. Yep, and this guy would go on to become the head of the astronaut office as well. If you'd like to know more about the corned beef sandwich incident, there is a link in the video description. Back to KSP and it's time to head to the MUN. We've grabbed ourselves a new unmanned contract which fits in nicely for our MUN visit and we have a new rocket, taking the design of the previously mentioned SPUD-1 and extending its core and upper stages to give it more Delta V. Which, upon playing back the footage, actually ended up being less Delta V by about 600 meters a second, so bigger, not always better when it comes to rockets. We'll be naming this program and its crafts the MOF series, short for MUN Observation Flybys slash Flights. And with that, it's time to take MOF1 to the launch pad. So as we head into the wild blue yonder, you might notice the core stage engine throttling down. Now I did this on purpose shortly after liftoff, as we had a really healthy thrust to weight ratio of two to one which was only going to climb as those SRB's weight became lower as we burned through their fuel. By the time we hit 8,000 meters, we were already at a velocity of 400 meters a second, and we're essentially entering a max Q event. I realize I've said a lot of technical terms there, so let's backtrack and explain this while the rocket makes its way to orbit. Firstly, max Q is the point of maximum dynamic pressure that a craft will receive. If you've ever watched a NASA rocket launch or some of SpaceX's live streams fairly early in the flight, someone will mention that the rocket has passed max Q and that the engines can now be throttled back up. 30 seconds into the flight, Artemis 1. First milestone will be for the vehicle to pass through max Q at about one minute and nine seconds into launch. This is the greatest period of atmospheric force on the rocket. Grossly oversimplifying it, max Q is the point where a spacecraft reaches a speed where the thickness of the atmosphere makes it much harder to accelerate at the same rate. And to punch through it, you'd need to expand a lot more fuel. Probably the easiest way to explain this that I've found is the experience of putting your hand out of a window of a vehicle while it's traveling. At slower speeds, your hand feels a little bit of resistance from the air, but you can keep it there fairly easily. But as the vehicle gets faster or accelerates abruptly, the pushback your hand feels is much stronger and becomes much more solid. What you're experiencing there is dynamic pressure, and the faster you go, the more particles and gases you have to pass through, which impart drag. During this event, the vehicle is hit with the maximum mechanical stress it's likely to see during a launch, due to the atmosphere behaving more like a liquid and creating much more drag on the craft. Liquid! Rockets typically throttle their engines down during this period to reduce the amount of stress they're putting on the vehicle's frame and also to save a little bit of fuel. Max Q varies for every vehicle. The Space Shuttle experienced it at about a height of 11 kilometers, but the Saturn V and Falcon 9, both very different sized rockets, saw it around the 13 or 14 kilometer mark. Now, while Kerbal doesn't technically have a max Q event, as the game's air pressure does not generally impart direct mechanical stress on the complete craft, only its individual parts, 
depending on how fast you ascend, at certain lower altitudes, you can be wasting fuel to punch through the atmosphere. This is typically when you see those aero trail effects, which turn into heat trails if you go any faster. Yep, friction is hot. So if I encounter these effects during a launch, I tend to lower the throttle of the craft to save a little bit of fuel and make sure we're not putting too much heat on the craft. Now, while there is a lot more to how Max-Q works, for Kerbal, that's really all you need to know. If you go too fast, the atmosphere becomes soup. Where are you right now? I'm at soup! What do you mean you're at soup? I mean I'm at soup! What? We'll come back to thrust to weight ratio during the second launch of the video, but for now, we've done our flyby of the MUN, we've come back into a curve and orbit, and have used narrow brake maneuver to lower that apoapsis. So one quick loop around the planet, and we'll make our re-entry pass. Moth-1's heat shield is hidden underneath the nose cone for re-entry purposes, so we had to eject that to keep our science nice and safe, and with the horizontal wings at the back, we've got a little bit more control as we make our way down into the atmosphere. The winglets were a bit of a pain in the butt during launch, but for re-entry, they've worked pretty well. So as we come down off the west coast of the KSC Peninsula, we've used those wings to guide us in for a nice, safe splashdown landing. This mission has gotten us a nice bucket of science, taking us up to a total of 282 points. And we got ourselves a nice thick stash of cash too, with our reserves now up to 850,000, thanks to completing a few milestones and missions along the way. And this means it's time to upgrade the KSC, so we'll upgrade our tracking station and then jump over to the folks at R&D. This time around, we're going to grab space exploration to get ourselves some handy tools, including ladders. We're also going to grab fuel systems, so those bigger fuel tanks and heavy rocketry to get the complementary skipper engine, which goes along with it, and some new SRBs. We'll come back and get propulsion systems next time as we're going to need those tiny fuel tanks for what I have planned for Moth 3. The teams have had a few days to digest the results of their first MUN mission, and they're pretty pleased with themselves. So we'll start off by picking up a few new contracts, such as transmitting science from the MUN's surface, achieving MUN orbit, putting a few satellites in orbit around the MUN, and landing a probe on the MUN. So with these objectives in mind, we need to build our new and improved MOTH-2. The upper stage of MOTH-1 works pretty well already and will stay the same barring a few new scientific instruments. We're going to build ourselves a much more powerful core stage using the new fuel tanks and engines we've acquired. No build montage for this cause it was honestly a mess, but we've upped our Delta V to 7200, with our core stage now having enough juice to get ourselves in a low circularized orbit and deorbit itself for retrieval too. Yes, we're going to try and bring this thing back home for profit. It always comes down to profit with you people, doesn't it? So let's get her on the launch pad and into orbit. This time around, we're ascending a lot slower than the previous Moth-1 mission, and this is due to the increased weight of our core stage. Even with the SRBs running at full pelt, I had to keep the core stage running at least 50% of thrust to keep our ascent profile good. After booster separation, we ended up with a thrust to weight ratio of about 1.7. However, that extra weight does come with a trade-off. We're two whole kilometers lower when the SRBs cut off compared to our last flight. Now, as promised, let's talk thrust to weight ratio or TWR. Thrust to weight ratio is exactly what it says on the tin. The ratio of your craft's thrust, i.e. your engine power, divided by the weight of your craft, i.e. how many snacks you've stuffed in the rocket. This ratio tells you if your rocket is powerful enough to lift itself and the higher your thrust to weight ratio, the faster your rocket can accelerate. Again, this also applies to aircraft, but it works a bit differently in that case as you're not trying to travel vertically and you can use lift to offset that lower thrust ratio. Back to rockets. If your rocket has a TWR of less than one, this means that at full thrust, it's not powerful enough to lift itself, so you definitely will not be going to space today. Low TWR crafts can work outside of atmosphere, which is why ion engines are pretty useful for long flights, but for leaving the planet, you need enough thrust to be able to lift your craft, and this value varies on each celestial body. It's also worth noting that as this is a ratio that takes weight into account, burning fuel reduces your weight, which in turn increases your thrust to weight ratio and your speed. If you've got a TWR of one, it means your booster has exactly enough thrust to support itself and hover using its own power. But that's not enough for it to take off. So how exactly do we achieve liftoff and get to space? As you might have guessed, we need a TWR higher than one. 
and a good TWR for a rocket to aim for is 1.5. 2 is great and 2.5 is excellent, but 1.5 is good especially for larger crafts. A TWR of 1.5 means you have enough power to lift 1.5 times the weight of the rocket. That 0.5 becomes your acceleration. And as you might have guessed, a TWR of 2 means you have enough thrust to lift 2 rockets worth of weight with an even higher rate of acceleration. As a rocket burns through its fuel, its weight begins to reduce and its TWR will rise. Again, this is because we're using up the propellant and its weight is no longer present. So to sum it up, TWR is the amount of thrust your rocket produces compared to how much it weighs. To lift off, you need a TWR greater than 1 and during your flight that ratio will become bigger as you're burning away the fuel that you have in storage. But anyway, look at that, we've arrived at the MUN. We've achieved orbit and also completed those two relay missions, which means money, fame and glory. But it seems a bit of a shame to just head on home after all this effort we've made to get here. So I've dropped down a quick save and decided to be a little bit reckless. We don't have any Kerbals on board, so only pride is on the line. Who needs landing gears? Let's land this baby on the MUN. He did. So yes, we're a little bit on our side, but it's okay, I have a solution for that. So let's gather up our science, get ourselves ready, and then the little trick here is we're going to use the magnometer boom as a kickstand. And there you have it. We've landed ourselves on the MUN with no landing gears and even landed on our side and managed to get ourselves back upright and up into orbit again. Now all we've got left to do is get home. While this looked easy, truth be told, it took me quite a few goes to get this right, mostly due to how Kerbal treats part collision and landed states. Using the magnometer as a kickstand sometimes locked the craft into the landed state as it was clipping through the MUN's surface. Therefore, it thinks you're on the surface of the MUN still, despite being in flight. This resulted in the game recording no flight data such as the trajectory or orbit, and eventually caused a rapid unplanned disassembly. The way I got it to work was firing the engines up while the boom of the magnometer experiment was deploying, as there's a small moment in there where it bumps you off the MUN's surface and the craft then gains flight status. So lesson learned, fun trick, but if you're not careful, the space kraken will get you. Throughout this mission, I've mentioned a lot of things that are not very easy to find in unmodded Kerbal, such as TWR, craft states, and a few other bits and pieces. I'm using a mod called Kerbin Engineer Redux to access all this information. This is the grey readout box on the left hand side of the screen and the info bars you see either side of the altitude readout at the top of the screen. While several of these readouts eventually became a part of the core game through updates such as Delta V by stage, a lot of the other useful information still isn't. And I can understand why, it might be considered pretty overwhelming for new players. However, with a highly customizable interface which allows you to choose what information you want to actually see and no impact on game performance that I've seen, Kerbal Engineer Redux is always a part of my game loadout, even when I'm playing unmodded saves, and this is just due to the depth of information it has. In future videos, you'll see me change those info readouts up the top to include a landing burn indicator for instance. Also, yes, I have recorded the missions all the way up to a crewed Minmus flight, but I've not had the time to sit down and edit them due to my work schedule. So hopefully with the time I've got off over Christmas and New Year's, I can dig into that backlog a little bit. And thankfully next year is not looking too bad at work either. Back to the mission at hand, and we've made seven passes of Kerbin's atmosphere to bleed off that speed from our MUN return. No, we were not very efficient for our return trajectory and I should have probably come in a little bit steeper because we have that wonderful heat shield at the front which can take a lot of punishment. However, now on our seventh pass into the atmosphere and we've got enough speed to send ourselves gliding down for a splashdown landing in the ocean. And we've completed quite a bit this mission. We've completed almost all the objectives needed for the unmanned program to the MUN. And that splashdown brings our Moth 2 mission to its end, and with it we've brought back a nice slice of science and recovered most of our vehicles, including the launch boosters and core stage, which were recovered through the stage recovery mod. 
Now it's time to spend some of that science, and for R&D purposes we need the propulsion systems, miniaturization, landing and advanced flight control nodes, and these will all make it much easier for what we're planning to do for Moth 3. We're also going to need to upgrade the R&D building so that we can actually handle some of those larger science pieces. While we could head straight to a crude MUN landing, we still have an important mission in our list to complete. Land three probes in three different biomes on the MUN. So that's what we'll be doing in our next video for Moth 3, all in one launch. But that is where we're going to leave things for this video. Thank you so much for watching. We've hit another milestone this past week, cracking 200 subscribers. So thank you all so much for hitting that button. And hello to Will Simkin, who was lucky number 200. I'll start on the next video in a little while, but I've got a back catalogue of games, books and shows to get through thanks to the overtime at work first. So give me till next year. As it is that time of the year, regardless of what you celebrate or believe, I hope you have a great end to your December and a good New Year's, surrounded by those who are important to you, whether that's in person or digitally. So until next time, thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you on the next pass.